Dear friends, welcome. Did you hear that number? Wouldn't you be happy if our work had saved just one life? I would. But we've done so much more than that. This movement is growing stronger every year. We are saving more and more lives thanks to all of you and your hard work. And we just heard all of you had committed to zero preventable deaths and 69,519 lives were saved. Well, here's how you did it. You did it through implementing our actionable patient safety solutions, including those for reducing healthcare-associated infections. You did it through improving the culture of safety with committed hospitals and reducing medication errors and improving both maternal and neonatal safety. There were also a record number of unique projects. For example, Lairdall Global took on the initiative of saving lives through simulation education and training. The Secretary of Health for Mexico City created a program in Mexico, El Medico in Tecasa, that brings hospital level care to vulnerable homes of patients. Baylor Scott and White Health created a high risk surgery initiative, which implemented volume standards for 11 highly complex procedures to reduce complications and Seoul National University Hospital is reducing in-hospital cardiac arrest during procedural sedation by using a pre-sedation checklist, keeping sedation records, and educating staff on sedation procedures. You'll hear from over a dozen groups in the next day and a half about what their institutions are doing to save lives every day in their hospitals. By January 2016, we announced here 24,643 lives were saved. And we made the goal to reach 50,000 lives saved by this year. As of February 2017, we've more than doubled that number. And in the last 12 months, you have worked so hard, you've gotten your colleagues to work so hard, and you've did it with full heart. So please give yourself a round of applause. Thank you. I would like to express a debt of gratitude for all of our volunteers, the regional network chairs, our steering committee members, the working groups that have worked on the three new apps and have improved the existing apps, and our board and the Massimo team for all of their volunteering and energy to this movement. I also want to thank the families that are here sharing their very personal and tragic stories. They probably wouldn't want to remember what happened, let alone speak about it, but they know their stories help save other people's lives. These stories are important because they encourage all of us to act so that no one else dies from medical errors. Now, if these stories were just anecdotes and there wasn't 200,000 plus people dying in our country, there weren't 3 million people around the world dying from preventable causes, I would not be trotting them in front of you. We would not be asking these families to do it. But these are just unfortunately just examples of what happens every day, every month, every year in our hospitals. I want to thank Ariana Longley, a one-woman army. Let's give her a big round of applause. I also want to thank Jordan Gamert. I want to thank Dr. Mike Ramsey. Dr. Steve Barker and Dr. Dave Mayer for the many sacrifices that they took to help keep this momentum of our patient safety movement going and make it stronger than ever. I 
I want to share with you some of our progress and some of our challenges for the year. Because it's important you hear both. On the progress side, we are now 43 countries strong. We have 20 regional chairs, 11 in the US, nine outside the US, working very hard to convince the hospitals in their regions to join the movement, join the commitment to zero preventable deaths. Medtronic signed the data pledge. And I'm really happy to say just this morning, Edwards Life Science signed the data pledge. We got new large commitments from the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, Laridol, March of Dimes, the Newborn Foundation, Sensor in Spain, and the VA Medical Center. They helped us blow away our goals. Each saved over 1,000 lives per year. So give them a round of applause, please. And also, one of my favorites, Parrish Medical Center in Titusville, Florida, became the first hospital to commit to implement every apps, every actionable patient safety solutions. And right behind them, our own Children's Hospital of Orange County right here, locally. So thank you, that's huge. I'm not gonna use that word again, but that's really big. But, but I have to say, imagine if all of you didn't just implement one or two or three or four of the apps, but you implemented all of them. You'll learn soon how many hospitals have committed. If we just did that, we'd be almost done. Well, I'm going to say it again, but we learned that Ariana and Jordan are forces of nature. And it's great to have them on our team. And President Obama announced Vice President Biden's Cancer Moonshot Project, which promises to make cancer, hopefully, a preventable death. And I know the Vice President humbly puts it, ending cancer as we know it, but I think it's going to do much more. And the seminal work done by Dr. Dave Mayer, our very own Dr. Dave Mayer, with his team from MedStar in implementing the CANDOR program, has shown that action out of kindness can not only be clinically gainful, but can be financially gainful. And that work, I believe, is just the beginning. And it's, they showed 50% reduction in mortality and saved, just last year, $30 million. Now imagine if every hospital adapted the CANDOR program, we would be halfway done, if not entirely done. This is the future of healthcare. A healthcare system that assures patient safety and dignity and healthcare providers safety and support. Let me just briefly explain candor to you. Very simple concepts. I call it actions out of kindness and transparency. The goal, apologize within an hour of a patient getting harmed. Don't charge the patient's family or the patient's insurance or payers any fees for any care that was given if they're harmed. Work with legal people that are not trying to protract settlement discussions. In fact, pay them a fixed fee, whether it settles for half an hour or five years. And most importantly, support the healthcare people. Don't shame or blame them. Instead, work with them to figure out how can we avoid this event again. So what did that produce? It produced incredible results. It makes sense. And my wife was telling me today that she's convinced that when you're kind, you also live longer. So hopefully one of you will do that study and, and prove my wife right. But we also had our challenges. Some hospitals that made commitments in prior years didn't update their pledges. Had they updated their pledges, we'd be probably announcing over 100,000 lives saved annually, even if you just took their numbers straight forward. I, I know they're still doing the work. I, I hope they're still doing the work. 
the Affordable Care Act is under revision, and so are some of the big patient safety initiatives it advanced. And also in the UK, NHS is being targeted for dramatic cuts, putting patient safety at risk. Despite some of these threats, we've managed to not only per persevere, but exceed our goals for 2016. And we made it. We are at our fifth summit. Our first summit started this movement with your love and actions out of kindness. The summit then turned into a movement. I remember as I was sitting down, the chief technical officer of CERNA said, we're in, we're gonna sign the pledge. At the first break, Rob and Beth from Intermountain Healthcare System said, we're signing on. And that's when I realized this is not just a summit, it's gonna be a movement. We're also lucky that President Clinton and Carter, Vice President Biden, Senator Boxer, Dr. Patrick Conway, uh, Surgeon General Rich Cremona, and many more influential people continue to be at our side. So here are some numbers to cheer you up. Let me summarize, 43 countries, 70 open data pledges, 3,526 hospitals around the world, of which 2,586 are based in the US and 940 international have joined the movement. <laughs> Their pledges have saved 69,519 lives, if not over 100,000. And guess what our 2017 goals are now? 150,000 lives saved annually. Half, <laughs> 150,000 lives saved in Italy. Half in the US, half outside the US. I'm excited, you know, every life matters. That's why we're here. But to be part of something that'll help save 150,000 lives, that's, that's meaningful. We'll live longer. Um, we did the hard work at the mid-year meeting. We figured out what are the three new things we got to go after, and we've created three new actionable patient safety solutions for a total of 13 apps. While all of these apps are very helpful processes to avoid preventable death, none is more important than the one, which is the first one, which is culture of safety. To get to zero, and to stay at zero, we must have at every institution a culture of safety from top down, protecting the patients and the caregivers. A culture where blame and shame is replaced with root cause analysis and action out of kindness. I know many of you are familiar with the concept of high reliability organizations. The concept was successfully implemented in Japan in the 50s and it, in the manufacturing area and it began showing its power in the 70s and 80s. When something went wrong, they didn't blame each other, they didn't call the police, they didn't call lawyers. They stopped the line, they fixed it, and turned the line on again. So just think for a moment, if we didn't do any more elective procedures until our hospitals had all implemented all the processes that are known to help save lives from medical errors. Japanese manufacturers knew that quality just didn't make their brand stronger and create more customer loyalty. They knew it also saved money. It helped their costs. So statistical process control, failure mode evaluation and analysis, lean manufacturing, they transformed manufacturing. And they did it first in Japan by actually an American engineer, Edward Deming, who inspired it. That's what we need now at our hospitals, along with our love for the patients. We need the culture of high reliability. That's why I'm so excited about candor. That's the right culture, and it produced the expected results. In the next day and a half, you are here to share your knowledge, share your experiences, 
learn from each other and recharge your batteries because we have so much work to do. To get to zero, we not only have to do what we're doing, what you're doing, but we gotta get everyone else, not just some other people, but everyone else in the healthcare ecosystem to join us. You have to be the best amongst us. That's what Thomas Bostrom, he and his wife lost their daughter to Clapsy. Central line associated bloodstream infection. That's what he said so articulately last year. That is a big responsibility that you've got to accept. I stand humbly in front of all the doctors and nurses. I couldn't fix a broken leg or save anyone's life except through you. And your miracle of healing is what gives us hope. But you've got to work together so that that miracle of hearing doesn't get interrupted by a medical error that leads to your patient's death. We have to reject the tyranny of apathy and embrace the brilliance of action out of kindness. We can't get to zero if we work half-hearted in healthcare. We need to constantly act out of kindness and thoughtfulness. Yes, to err is human but to not put processes in place that avoid errors becoming fatal is inhumane. When a patient dies unnecessarily, it's not just a tragedy to their family, their community, but it's a tragedy for the caregiver in charge. So many great doctors and nurses that we need leave the profession when that happens to them. We can't let that happen. We have to stop it. We have to do all that we can do. So now let me move to the part I'm sure you've been waiting for. Let me introduce Vice President Biden. The Biden family is truly a shining example of public service grounded in compassion and action out of kindness. It's sad and ironic, and I'm so grateful that Vice President Biden is here today, because he had to go to Mass today, because today, Bo Biden would have been 48 years old, but he still came. Tragically, brain cancer took him away from us about two years ago. I want to take a moment and reflect on and honor Bo's legacy. Bo was committed to his family, his home state of Delaware, and to our country. As many of you know, he served in Iraq as a member of the Army National Guard and also served as the Attorney General of Delaware. If cancer had not taken him away from us, he likely would have been Governor of Delaware and perhaps following his father's footsteps, gone to become a national leader. In the wake of losing his son, Vice President Biden noted that his family's grieving process closed the window on his potential run for the White House during our recent election. Bo was a close personal friend, and I'm proud that he's being remembered in so many positive ways. One of the final pieces of legislation signed into law by President Obama included funding for the Bo Biden cancer moonshot, which Vice President Biden has championed. <laughs> I'm also proud that Massimo is a supporter of the Bo Biden Foundation for the Protection of Children. Please join me in a moment of silence to remember Bo and honor his lasting legacy of service. While Bo's death today is not considered preventable, we hope that through Vice President Biden's efforts to end cancer as we know it, 
it will soon be considered preventable. Bo's tragic death was not just a big loss to his children, wife, siblings, and parents, but to the world. Not only because of what great things he was set to accomplish, but it also meant that one of the most enlightened, honest, and hardworking public servants, Vice President Joe Biden, did not run for president in 2016. Had he run and won in the primaries, I'm sure he would have been president and we would have been spared some of these executive orders. <laughs> we are about unity here. We exemplify it. We need unity. It will take some time before death from cancer is considered preventable. But there are over three million people dying in hospitals worldwide each year from deaths that are preventable. Only God knows what some of these people would have contributed to our society, to humanity, to science, to our progress. We are all here because we don't want any more preventable deaths. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so proud to introduce a remarkable man who served our country and the world for over 45 years. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1972 at age 29. Served six terms, sounds familiar? 36 years in the Senate before becoming the greatest vice president ever. That's a fact. <laughs> His key accomplishments in the Senate were so many, I'm not gonna list them all, but there is one I have to mention, the Violence Against Women Act. As vice president, he oversaw the Economic Re Recovery Act. And with his efforts, none of that money went to waste. And with the speed of implementation that only Joe Biden could demand, he and President Obama let us out of the Great Recession. He launched the Affordable Care Act with the president that has at least saved 125,000 lives through initiatives like Partnership for Patients and was last year the recipient of our humble humanitarian awards. The speed the VP took on the cancer moonshot was similar to the speed and persistence he took on with the Economic Recovery Act. Under the Vice President Biden's leadership, the White House Cancer Moonshot Task Force catalyzed novel, innovative, and impactful collaborations among 20 government agencies, departments, and White House offices, and over 70 private sector collaborations, all designed to achieve a decade's worth of progress in five years in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cancer. One initiative made clinical research trials more accessible to cancer patients. Another great initiative established the Genomic Data Commons a first-of-its-kind public data platform for storing, analyzing, and sharing genomics and associated clinical data on cancer. The Vice President helped lead the effort to pass the 21st Century Cures Act that provides $1.8 billion over seven years for the cancer's moonshot scientific priorities and many other good provisions for patient safety. The Vice President was also recently awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom with Distinction, which is the highest level of honor a civilian can get in our country, which I was very proud to witness. It was humbling and inspiring experience like every time you're in his presence. And he's not done yet. As a private citizen, he's continuing his great work with the launch of the Biden Foundation, focusing on ending cancer as we know it, and pursuing justice, equity, and fairness for all. And he's been a staunch supporter of the patient safety movement. From the first time I told him what we're up to, I remember he immediately said to me, this is important. I want you to come back and spend two hours with me to teach me everything about it that you can. I got there with our board, with a patient safety advocate. He listened intently. And since that day, I knew he was committed and would stick 
with us to decrease the number of preventable deaths, and he did. But personally, Vice President Biden, and in fact, all the Bidens, are really great friends to our family. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President Joe Biden. Thank you.